back on the road. The Chrysler Chronicles is back on the road. I already told y'all in the community post, I'm not sure how it works with people getting those because y'all have heard the tales of people not seeing certain stuff on YouTube or whatever. But regardless, I'm back on the road again. And also I mentioned, and you could probably tell, Mr. Cheshire Cat Smiles is back. Yes, I am. How you yes, doing? Yes, I am. Doing pretty good. Pretty good. Oh my God! So, before we get this one started, because this is about to be quite a quite an interesting one, because later on I'm gonna actually go back into the cutting room floor of video ideas that I had, and I'm gonna bring it back. Before I get started, though, I want to shout out some folks before we get into this. There, I want to give a shout out to one of the newest supporters of the channel, one of my new friends that I made. Edo4, Edo Numo4, check him out on his YouTube channel there. Shoutouts to Rare Breed Games. In case you didn't catch that particular community post, at this point right now, in certain regions that is, I have to make that specific, you can wishlist Blazing Strike right now on Steam and PSN. I know somebody mentioned over in the EU they didn't see it, and I actually told Rare Breed about it, and they're going to be on that, so shoutouts to them. I've been kind of a billboard for him for the past couple of days or so. Because <laughs> I had posted my post on Twitter there and like they shared it and it's like it's just been spreading. Because I'm like wondering why am I getting all this traffic and it's like, uh, okay. Because I thought all the traffic would go that way. <clears throat> they're the ones making the game. It's two-way street, man. Yeah. But it's just like they're the one making the game. I'm just overzealous fan. Right. So, <laughs> so there you go with that. And also, again, shout outs to all the new subs, and I hope y'all are doing well. Now, I'm about to say something that's probably going to make the wrestling fans on my channel probably roll their eyes or be like, aha! But, Mr. Cheshire Cat, Mr. Smiles, mm -hmm. what do you want to talk about? Ooh, boy. Oh, buddy. So many things. What to pick, what to choose, what to choose. Now, let's start with, hmm, mm, 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 mm. Can't get hard about this one. I am. <laughs> so, so many things. And so a little time. <laughs> Actually, the project for later is off limits. We got that. That's right, going right. to be the close up. Right. Now, now, uh, let, let's, let's do a little backtracking action. Mm-hmm. We've uh type of received a little a little little little, little gator snapping on the on the last video. Oh, uh, oh no, y'all done pissed them off. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh man. Okay, so let me just go down that hole. So you talking about when we were talking about my, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so <laughs> never thought we would get to this, but hey, it is what it is. So let's clear up some misconceptions right quick. Let's go some misconceptions, because I know exactly what he's alluding to. Let me ask you something. Do you hate the new Fatal Fury City of the Wolves my design? I do not hate it. Okay. Because I remember. So, I remember. so okay, y'all heard that, right? Mm. He does not hate it, and I don't either. I don't know where the... Because <laughs> if I remember correctly, oh I said that I didn't think the fan suited the leather suit aesthetic. Yeah, you had but a I critique. I didn't say I hated it. Yeah, you had a critique, man. Exactly. And it was a pretty light critique on top of that. Now, I know y'all don't know him very well then, but we talked about many of things, gaming, music, and otherwise or whatnot. I wouldn't know if this man thinks something is garbage. You you know what? You know, you and y'all should know when I think something is garbage. Y'all know the characters in fighting games that I don't like, whether it's Gongil, whether it's Maxima, whether it's Blanca. Y'all heard me talk mess and you know what it is. If I really did not like something, you would know that or whatnot. Where the fuck did y'all get the fact that I dis we dislike freaking we hate my or whatever? You know, there's what, a you, whole, know, you know what they remember? There was a the whole course. there was a whole ass freaking video that we did before that episode. Matter of fact, I'm gonna work my new gimmick right here. Let's hit the clip. This right here. Thank you, SNK. Granted, of course, it's not the preferred outfit that I would have wanted for her. I actually wanted to see this, which you know what? It could possibly have come from this or whatnot, but 
yeah, I like this look. I like this look. It's not like the most drastic redesign, but I do like the drip. It's actually... <laughs> Uh, I have to see more of it again then, but I could almost possibly say I like it more than the original. Do you see it now? Do you see that? Like, I still feel the same way. Nah. I still feel the same way, okay? So where are y'all getting the fact that we're angry? Somebody said we were angry about for Do you know? Do you know what they remind me of? What? You know what they, these, uh, the Gator Snappers remind me of? They call me all Gator Snappers. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, before you get to that, before you get to that, I want to put some here because I know how some of y'all are on this platform. Let me introduce a concept to you called, if it don't apply, let it fly. Ooh, bar, if it don't down, apply, down. let it fly. Make sure If it write don't it down. apply, let it fly. Write it down. If it don't apply, let it fly. If you are being annoyed with me re <laughs> repeating stuff, get ready because unfortunately, apparently some of y'all need repetition. Because everybody's not guilty of this then, but it's like, again, and here's another misconception. I'm pretty sure Smile feels the same way. We don't care about people disagreeing. Of course not. We care more about the respect. It ain't about how much you agree or disagree. We about the respect. And taking people out of context and everything and all this other freaking underhanded stuff, cherry picking and stuff, that ain't respectful. Wait a minute. What? Just to uh, show off uh, what I'm comparing the Gator Snappers to, oh, I'm going to use uh, some YouTube powers myself. <laughs> Fans, check this out. But, sir, there's got to be something I need to improve on. Anything! All right, the sauce. Uh, what? The sauce. I don't know. You're using too much sauce. Okay? Review's over. Uh, 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 what? Uh, you got in on the gimmick kind of quick there. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. <in> okay. <laughs> that was a little quicker than I expected. But like, just to clarify, I guess like neither one of us hate the new Mai. Okay. He had a little bit of like a slight criticism. I still like the whole thing. I don't know, like, where is this coming from? And then it's like on top of that. Nabil, which I mentioned in the last episode, y'all know Nabil, Neo Geo now. Y'all know that he, very good relationship with SNK to the point where he's had, or at least, yeah, he's had several different interviews with them. He had another one after Mai got revealed. And they said it straight up there that the Mai, the classic Mai that we saw, it's not, at, the, at this point in time, it is not... A selectable costume. Why is it that it comes straight from S and K and y'all still don't believe it? And on top of not believing stuff, several different times I keep hearing, "Oh, I never saw anybody bitching about the new Mai. I didn't see anybody bitching about that." Oh my God! Not only are we getting, <laughs> not only are we getting repetition as a gimmick here, but now it's also going to be montage time. You and look, I understand it. I understand it. Some people have it lucky. You know what I'm saying? But I am not a fan of this mentality where it's like, I didn't see it. I didn't hear it. Therefore, it's not happening. This is the same mess that happened when it came to KOF 15's bad matchmaking because I always made it clear. Even though I personally didn't have that many problems finding matches in KOF 15, that does not negate the concerns of other people that said the matchmaking was trash or it took too long to find matches. Just because it wasn't happening to me does not mean it's not happening to somebody else. I would think that this is a fairly simple concept. If you didn't see anybody bitching about the new my, good for you, but it still happened. Hear somebody bitching, 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 hear somebody bitching. You get it now. Hey, Lois. What? You, you what, what, what's that? What? You, like, right, right there. Oh, and there's somebody else bitching too. And here's another one. And note that I'm pulling from different platforms on top of that. Why is it so shocking to y'all that <laughs> people tell you some people are doing some mess on Twitter or whatever, or complaining about Twitter, or complaining on Twitter? 
like yes i am one of those people that will tell you that twitter is not a real place but like you have to be nuanced about these things it's definitely happening you want to know why i know it's happening because some people are trying to get the bag off of it the good old culture war warriors are at it again mm. <laughs> you like you want something to say, <laughs> you have something to say about that Y'all don't, might. y'all don't see him, but there's this grimace on his face. <laughs> I might, I might, I might have something to say. Hmm. What is up with this mess with censorship with y'all? Do y'all even know what that is? Like, why is it because, like, is it because that she's just showing less skin? I told you it's the MK X to eleven uh, syndrome all over Boy, again. Yeah, you did. It's a skin tight freaking suit. <laughs> Y'all acting like freaking my prance out here in a Victorian dress or something. That's what I'm right. Like she came out in a three-piece suit. <laughs> three-piece suit, my. <laughs> That'd be freaking crazy. She had ass on a two-piece suit. She's still sexy. Oh, yes. But it's like any other area got to clear with this whole my thing. Because like I said, we're both, we both like my. I'm still a my fan. On top of that, I even said, I like the fact that it seems like they're going to take her story in a slightly different direction since also so Kaku got mentioned. And it's not just, Andy, 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 oh, Andy. It was getting boring. Oh, my God. Like, even Onyx, shout out to always, he even mentioned that. Like, we like that. And, I mean, here's another thing. I'm pretty sure, because y'all have done this with the <laughs> Y'all have done this with this very same company, SNK, with this very same character, my before. No, my, no, bye, no, my, no, bye. I'll bet you y'all can freaking bully SNK into releasing a freaking my DLC costume at this point. Look, I'll bet you it's gonna look, happen. Look, people. I'll it's, bet it's, you it's, it'll happen. It's simple. It, it, it's a simple answer. They, they, they're saying, oh, this character's not in the game. If mine's not in the game, we're not gonna buy it. It's a simple. Oh, there's, there's a simple. There's a simple solution, people. Ooh. The internet exists. Ooh. You can look at titties on the internet. You don't have to look at them while you're playing the game. You said something else, then, because somebody was talking some mess. Like, I don't know if it was just directed at me or directed at you or both of us, but they tried to align us with those people, product culture war cuck boys. Talking about we were inventing another excuse to not play the game. And Bias like, that ain't us. Not at all. That ain't us. They ain't not like us. <laughs> okay. Like, I, 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 I took a bucket to the top of the <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't get that. I don't get how, what's the phrase? You're cherry picking. That's what it is. It's you're... just cherry picking because y'all have known by now i have been praising city of the wolves like nobody's bi business man i've said the same thing time after time after time again city of the wolves to me feels like especially after what we saw from freaking gamescom and i still stand by it this right here is snk really trying this right here this game is a lot more ambitious than king of fighters 15. I ain't saying it's better. I still like KOF 15. Let me put that out there. I still like KOF 15. I still like KOF 15. You think the freaking repetition is annoying? Imagine freaking being cherry picked just as much. Yeah, but I me, said, but me. I said something. Hold on. This game, City of the Wolves, right here, this right here, is the more ambitious product from SNK. It looks freaking phenomenal. They really invested in that whole, like, this new design or whatever, because everybody, everybody was talking mess about, it just looked like King of Fighters 15. No, it doesn't. I can understand why you would probably say that, because a lot of the characters that are in that game got transferred over, but it doesn't look just like KOF 15. And then the single-player content, the mini-games, the freaking RPG mode. I could end up not liking the RPG mode, but I like... I'll be happy if other people the enjoy effort, it. The A for effort. It's the effort. If other people enjoy that mess, good. Right. And then on top of that, the freaking customizations with the colors they brought the mess back that I think we last saw in KOF 13, yes. far as like yes. recent, recent SNK fighting games. This is some ambitious stuff. And they even got the freaking, um, got the jukebox. Exactly. Jukebox with freaking stuff from AOF on top of that because it's a shared universe. I have been praising it like. Not everything, but I've been praising that mess ex- 
extensively. But you over here talking about some freaking, you find an excuse to play the, get out of here. You find an excuse to not play the game. Get out of here, man. No, look. Can y'all please listen? Can y'all please listen? I know we live in this clickbaity, what else, rage baity, freaking time or whatever then, but everybody is not on that mess. If I post something that's going to probably be rage bait, like if it's an opinion I know it's unpopular, I'm going to stand on the mess. Right. A lot of y'all that pull rage bait, y'all be posing. <laughs> Y'all right. just know what's gonna push all the buttons, the wrong ones. Now let me tell let me tell the people. We are down. We but yeah, come on. If it, if there's no mistake here, sorry for ranting here, but like if there's no mistake, we are firmly in the camp of City of the Wolves. And I don't know if he pre-ordered, but I will eventually. I'll get a ride to it. Yeah, you'll get to it. Like I don't know if you did, but I know I did. Now, let me tell the good people uh something from the book of sense, because it's not common sense anymore. Ding ding. Let me put my reading glasses on. Uh, it says here in the book of sense, you can be a fan of something and also a critic. Yeah. Like I said, he just made a critique like the fan. What? The fan. My fans. My fans because the fan. Right. In the, <laughs> it always gets me. There is even a character in Ace Attorney that makes that pun. He's like a, he was like a rock ago storyteller. He's like, my best fan deserves a fan after all. And he literally tosses a fan at them. <laughs> but it's like, he made a light critique then. It's just that right there. And I even still, like, even in the beginning, like the person I mentioned from um, last time, I'm sorry I forgot your name, but I'll throw the comment up here. I didn't really, like, agree with this nitpick. Well, hang on. It's a critique. Whatever. I know nitpick has some negative connotations. I was gonna I was saying nitpick because I feel like, you know, nitpicks are usually small. And it wasn't like, you know, something major where it's like, yeah, 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 this thing, this one little thing sucks, so the whole thing sucks. But then when I thought about it, going back, like I actually saw this comment and I went back and I watched the trailer and I'm like, oh, you know. And like I said, the whole chain idea was just chaining. <laughs> off of what that person said exactly i like the new like i was y'all know i've been begging for a new a new my design honestly especially seeing that i mean terry got his usual stuff and i mean that was never going to change they were going to keep rock about the same but it's like mostly it's the old school fatal fury characters that are getting like new looks and like billy got his if andy and joe get what we saw here they get theirs you know so it's just that, like, I'm just clearing up some stuff here, okay? <laughs> we ain't angry about New Mai. We like New Mai. We angry at the culture war warriors that are trying to make this something else or whatever. Like, they're trying to pander to Western people or something else, which is very funny because I remember somebody, like, was trashing Capcom in that case because of the whole Cami thing. But then look, <laughs> look at... <laughs> Wait, how, look wait. at freaking! It's just like they said that about Capcom, and Capcom, I guess, is going to Wook or something. What? What, and yet, what was the criticism about yet, Cammy? The new design, like the one where she looks like Blue Mary almost, because she's wearing pants. I just said the my whole wait thing, a minute. My whole thing is this though. So you telling me? My whole thing is this though. You so got you, my seemingly gonna be in the classic outfit if we're going by what we saw on the little banner for season two. So you, you're telling me. That because she is a blonde woman with pants, she's they're trying to copy off Blue Mary. No, like no, I said that because some people some people kind of compared it or whatever, or whatnot. Not with also with the cut because we know Cammy having the braided pigtail, but right. Like with this new, like with her Street Fighter Six default, she has like the little shortcut or whatnot. Right. Just like they were saying, not that, really. It's not. No, it was just the fact they didn't like the fact that it wasn't vintage Cammy. The fact right, that she, they, that she didn't have cheeks showing out, which she still caked up. They like, still, they still have like, She's still bitch. caked up. <laughs> Just like what was it? Uh, Strive, Giovanna. Oh, it's a a, a redheaded woman with a, a dress shirt on. Huh, Vanessa. That did happen. <laughs> I remember, like there was a Reddit post or something that had it had Vanessa, and I think they kind of like made Vanessa tan. And they got like this random picture of a wolf and they like greened it up and like they put the symbol in like there, that's Javon, that's Javon. <laughs> and you know what? With that, honestly, I mean, eh, that used to kind of bug me a little bit, but 
I mean, it, I mean, they're both cool characters, and I mean, I kind of can see. I don't know. You know what that because, reminds me of. I mean, you know, like, it's Vanessa most... The funny thing is, like, given what both of them are mostly known for in terms of their arsenal, they kind of do it at the same ratio. Right. Because Vanessa's known for the hands, but, you know, you see yeah, them... Yvonne is known for the kicks. The, like, the legs and everything, but, like, both of them, you know, do a little bit of the other, you know. Vanessa has a couple of moves that involve kicking, and then Giovanna has some hands, too, or whatnot, so... But it's so funny you mentioned Giovanna. So that was my, that's my favorite character in Guilty Gear right now. And when I lost the drive for Strive and I can't, you know, I stopped playing. I love what they did with her in Strive. That new move where it's like she command dashes and then like she does like a enhanced version of one of her four special moves, and that mess is so good. Like that's what it is. Like you do like a it's a command dash and like no. so it's like uh, what's yeah. the what? There's a character. Uh, Street Fighter Five Seven. Hmm. It was one of the. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't play them, so. The V drives where he has a dash, and then you can do the special move from the dash, and it'll be like an enhanced version. Oh, okay. And it was basically all, all forward moving versions of his specials if you did it from the dash. Oh, okay. Shout out to Arxis, because, like. Pfft. Congratulations. I need, to try, I need to try that out. Congratulations, man, because I've been enjoying Strive when I got back into it. I enjoy, I even, uh, I enjoy Ram Lethal's new move. Yeah. When I started back playing, I actually haven't seen that many Ram Lethal players, but I know she's a little quick, I think. Just a little yeah, quick. like a little ground quake. Yeah. And then, like, um, I don't know why, because I always look at Mei as a troll character. And when I say Mei is a troll character, I mean like a character that's literally just meant to bother you to do stuff. Like, can't make, she, like, cancel the Totsugeki or yep, something? Yep, you can Totsugeki and hop off the bed. <laughs> because it's like, I don't know, it's, it's crazy that this character... Now, is that new functionality or is it a new move that is, it's the Totsugeki, but you jump off of it? Totsugeki, but you jump off. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Like, do you, does she still write it or does she just send it? You can write on it, like... And then you jump off of it. Ugh. And then you can follow up like with any air moves or whatnot. So continuous pressure from... Ugh. It's a little gimmicky, to be honest. But, you know, when you are done pestering folks or whatever, and they get a little too comfortable. See, that's the problem with it. It's like that character will make you block, and then you forget that this tiny character has a command throw. Right. And heaven forbid you're in the corner because it's going to be a gnarly freaking combo into a wall break. It's a pow! <laughs> I like how when they... The new moves, I think, is like... I, Because the one thing, the reason why I stopped talking about Strive, because here's my thing. If a game is just, like, dry or just getting boring to me and I can't tell you exactly, like, why or whatnot, like, and I mean directly and specifically, then I won't really say much of anything because in certain cases that also might mean it might be a me thing. Right. But with that being said, I feel like the new moves and some of the new mechanics I think were the little bit of you know like wild spice rush. That yeah wild rush um, and there's like a guard there's like a push block guarding I forgot right. what it's called and you know what I like about mm-hmm. when they when cause you it, most fighting games have that I guess mid life point where it's like we're gonna add some new moves to the characters and you know this that and other right Strive needed that right 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 now I like that the newer characters have in their kit, stuff that interacts with the functionality of the game more. Like with Slayer, mm-hmm. for instance. He oh, has the whole... Boy, they right. Ooh. Ooh, they <laughs> How strong he is aside. Like, he has the whole uh, certain moves that aren't supers that just break the wall. Yeah. I just know that for <laughs> But he, he is strong. That super is <laughs> wild. They freaking... They can't stand it right now. They can't stand freaking Slayer right now. Shout outs to the fighting game Glossary. Ah. They need an app for that. If they don't have one, then yes, you're right. Because last time I checked, they didn't have an app. It's just a website. Which, then again, I could have just pinned the website to yeah. my screen, so... I just like the fact that they're keeping it updated because, like, I mean, when I first, like, learned about the glossary there, I just thought that it was meant to basically 
get people up to date on like a lot of the more obscure jargon terms that have been in fighting games for a while. But I appreciate the fact that they also include new mechanics. Like like this this mechanic is still fairly new, right? So I like the fact they're doing that as well. But like, it's freaking. <laughs> Oh, freaking Slayer. Like, it's it's just funny to me because it's one of those things where it's like, you know, y'all said y'all wanted Slayer. It's like, why y'all upset about him being back? He's like, well, he's crushing everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's status quo, really. Because it was really good in the previous game as well. Freaking Guilty Gear Strive made it back onto the podcast. Because the last time I talked about Strive, if I'm not mistaken, was actually on... <laughs> I almost want to say I think it might have been episode one because that's when they revealed the upcoming season. Right. And I still can't really think of another example. I think there might be one out there that I'm overlooking, but I still can't find it. You talking I just about find the new character? Not just, well, yes, new character. Yes. Um, well, the character yes. that is yeah, in, from the yeah, upcoming yeah. anime. Yeah, Unica. Unica. Which I think it comes out next month. And see, that's the thing. It's like, I can't think of a series where it's like we got a character from an adaptation coming to the game. Because in essence, this is an adaptation. Right. And you said like it's coming out next month. So it's like obviously it is going to be here before she is. And he's doing a little double check. Good on little you. Little double check. Because if that's the case, then that means like. Because Dizzy's the first character. We're going to see the adaptation before we see her in the game. Because the first character I think is Queen Dizzy. Yes, it's Dizzy Venom and then, yeah, Dizzy Venom and then Lucy. I think her name is no, it's Dizzy Venom, Unica, the new character, Unica, and then Lucy is the last Lucy, character. Yeah. And I still don't know anything. Oh, I was I was wrong. It's not. Oh. Uh, it's not uh, next month. It comes out in twenty twenty five. Might get released side by side. Yeah, that that makes more sense because Dizzy comes out this month. We probably might get Venom at the top of the year. Yeah. And then, like, probably spring, summer is when the anime will drop with uh, the new character. Right. And then, like, probably winter-ish, fall, winter is when we're going to get Lucy. Right. And once again, like, see, that, again, is the magic. We talked about this before. This is the magic of guest characters. Because I don't know anything about cyberpunk aside from the fact friend of good friend of mine and friend of the channel, Vault, shout out to Sully, hates them. <laughs> I, 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 I do as well. I do as well. I played you that clip of him. Yes. Freaking, you know what's so funny about that? You know what's so funny about that? He did a recent video where I think it was... I think it was Dextero, but somebody else took a crack at making a top 100 games of all time list. Ah, Because GQ did that mess last year because he did a, a video reaction to that. But <laughs> as I check to see if I got the right, yep, it's this, yep, it's Dextero. <laughs> because I clipped it too. I freaking clipped it because freaking Cyberpunk popped up in it. <laughs> right. Yo, he did it again. <laughs> right. You know, makes sense. Fuck! Cyberpunk 2077. What the fuck are we talking about? This game fucking sucks. <laughs> how, does, how the fuck is, did this beat both Dooms fucking, uh, Shadow of the Colossus? What the fuck? Okay, I gotta read the example. <laughs> he, he, here's why I hate Cyberpunk. Oh my god. Here's why I hate Cyberpunk. Vault, if you're listening, you know you the homie. It's just... <laughs> we, we, his hate, his hate we, 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 me, me and Vault are hate brothers. His hatred of that mess just makes me laugh. Like I, don't, like I said, I don't know anything about Cyberpunk. It's just his reaction to it is just good. Um, but I don't hate the game. I hate the anime. <laughs> the anime is um what Lucy comes from, right? Yes. So, this is why I hate anime. Have you seen something where it almost seems like literally everybody does something stupid just to drive the plot? Why do I feel like there's a term for that type of storytelling? There probably is. But I know what you're talking about. But the whole... Because the show's been out for like two years, so spoiler alert for anybody. It, it, it's... It's one because if you don't know the show, is basically one of those uh, everybody dies or most everybody dies type stories. 
like a like a set it off type fucking story. All right. And literally everybody that died made stupid decisions. Like 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 wildly stupid decisions. Cause there's a thing with Cyberpunk where you know people get augmentations on their body and stuff like that, right? Right. And if you get too many augmentations, you can suffer from something called cyberpsychosis. Which uh, there's a long form version of what that is, but the short form is that your brain isn't is basically like disassociating like with the mechanics in your body, mm. and you kind of go crazy and like go on these killer spree and shit like that, right? Go crazy. One of the characters had these big ass giant Jack's arms, right? Right. And it was like, hey, you showing signs of cyber psychosis? You might want to downgrade those arms so you don't go fucking crazy. Right. What does he do? He doesn't take them off. Uh, ends up getting himself killed and ends up killing like his uh his significant other, right? Mm-hmm. So what does the main character do after he dies? He takes that nigga's arms and puts them on. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I know... Some people get a kick out of that, but like I know some people are not a fan of the like what they call constant idiocy storylines. Yeah, every because because in my opinion, at least, main character got a lot of people killed just from his personal motivations. <laughs> but it that, that's why I hate anime. Game is I to me, right? Because I don't know if you were familiar with like how the game was on launch because people were the game was terrible. On launch. Uh, if I'm if I'm remembering this correctly, isn't it like the game where someone mentioned they had to start the game back over because they ran into a wall and got stuck? Yep, game breaking bugs and stuff like that at lunch. Now, because it, it's one of those uh, situations where the game itself is phenomenal, but the bugs just killed it for everybody, mm. and then they eventually fixed it. Like they, they basically fixed it in time to release the anime because mm. the anime brought people back to the game. Mm, really? Yeah, and then they had a bunch of um, balance patches and fixed all the bugs, added new features and stuff like that. Oh, Which, okay. there were even like locations and items that you could find of the characters from the show in the game. Because <laughs> uh, there's a, everybody's fan favorite character in Cyberpunk, not Lucy. Mm. Chick named Rebecca. I heard that name. Like, when they had announced that... When they had announced... Lucy, you know, you know, you know how it goes, or whatever. Like, you get like the one guest character from something. It's like, oh, you know, I wish. They I think I know where you're going because they they would they should have put Rebecca because she seems yeah, like much more of a fighter. Yeah, that whole than, thing, that whole thing where it's like, oh, why didn't they pick this character? Because they're more, you know, why did she this? literally has big robotic arms? Yeah, I've seen her. I've yeah, seen her. she literally has big robotic arms. Has that would have been. She has big robotic arms. Yes. Maybe never mind. I'm not gonna say that. Like I was say, say maybe they thought she should have been in arms. <laughs> like, like she, she, she literally has a pair of Hulk hands, but you didn't put her in a fighting game. <laughs> Which, funny enough, from what I remember, those weren't replacements for her arms. They were more like uh, gauntlets almost, and not like she replaced her arms with Gauntlet those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss it. I miss yeah. it so much. Inferno Divider. I'm about to ask what Blaze Blue, been up, Blaze Blue has been up to. That was the last thing I have heard about them was the uh, the little roguelike game that they mm. have on a PC, which I heard was pretty good. Mm. Trying to they're trying to venture out a little, a little platformer, bit. basically, a little Hollow Knight style game that has Blaze Blue characters. Wow, and it's so crazy because. We're talking about like fighting games and we're talking about like adaptations and everything with and I had just stumbled into this bit of news from like a while ago from last month, but a Sega fighter is about to get an adaptation apparently. And this one's rather obscure. Though some of you might know about it, Eternal Champions. Mm, that's never apparent, heard of it. That's apparent. Like this was back on the Sega Genesis in nineteen ninety three. So Ooh, that was the year I cr- I was created. Mm, so <laughs> but it's just kind of fun. I just ran into that right there. Uh, but like I said, once again, 
of all the games to get on the guest character bandwagon, I still too, I know I probably said it like in several other episodes, probably in this, this the very same one that I referenced where I talked about Unica. That was not on the bingo card right there. And that's, that's, not, and that's not even to say like anime-ish fighting games don't do that. Like I learned that after I did the fighting game guest character icebreaks. Like a little bit of everybody does it. Right. The freaking traditional fighters. The, the, tr- tr- the traditional freaking fighter that Uniel did it. They even brought him back for the sequel. Which that's not <laughs> like that's see people underestimate that that right there is a rarity. <laughs> not often do you have a returning guest character, especially. If it's third party, right. that is a rarity. But you know who did it? My did it. DOA five, DOA six. Straight now, on. You know what I think is becoming a trend? What's what is? So nobody expected Lucy, right? For Guilty to get. Uh I think fighting games coming up with like complete left field uh, guest characters. Mm-hmm. Is becoming a thing because take take it. Who who may, 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 maybe one nigga in a basement somewhere was like, I hope they put Negan in Tekken and he got what he wanted. But nobody like the rest of the world is like Negan. What? Nah. Very fun character, annoying to some people, but very fun character. <laughs> uh. Then you got some of the characters in uh that were in like MK11 and one that was like, hmm, okay. That works, but I didn't expect this. You know, right? Uh, and once again, Guilty Gear is like cyberpunk, really? You know, it works. <clears throat> I guess, but it, you wouldn't expect it. I am not that hip to freaking cyberpunk. I don't know if there's like some pre-established freaking relationship or something with the companies or whatnot. No, I just didn't expect it one way. Like, I mean, it could have. They could have probably thrown Ragnar up there, and I probably would have been like, I didn't expect that. I would have loved that. I, I would have loved the Blaze Blue guest character. Yeah. <laughs> so in the last episode, we learned a little bit about Smiles' history with KOF. And that does bring me to like a whole nother discussion that I guess I want to revisit because I know whether it's myself, whether it might be last person that I saw talk about it, talking about it was Rizzy. Shout out as always. When it came to you learning King of Fighters, because the big thing with a lot of people is why they won't pick up the game is because, oh, do I have to freaking learn three characters? Do I have to learn three characters? So for somebody who's still fairly new to the series, because you said 14 was your first one, right? Right. Right. So for you, a newer player. Mm Mm-hmm. Was that an issue to you, as far as like learning three characters? Uh, no, and here's why. Uh, so one, both local and online, you can not do three on three. You can just do one on one, right? So that's one that gives me I can just do one on ones with the character I want to learn and build them up, get comfortable with them. Then I can move on to the next character move on to the next character until I have a team of characters I'm comfortable playing with. You know? Yeah, because and it's, or... It's for somatic context, because I have told y'all little bits and pieces about this story. When he brought King of Fighters 14 over to the shop, as we call it, people know it's a card shop because card games, I think, are a more priority there, even though they still had setups. Right. But I've told y'all about the fact that a lot of people got exposed to King of Fighters, like down there where we live, from him bringing it there. Because I remember, I've told y'all before, Bandeiras was one of the most popular characters amongst the people here because we got a bunch of Naruto fans around here. And that man screamed Naruto, not to mention, of course, just look at him. (laughs) Right. But I say all that to say another thing that I remember us doing. Because, I mean, like I said, I've been down with the series for years. You know what I'm saying? But I remember y'all would play 1v1s all the time. Right. Because I remember, like, we would be playing, like, rounds and everything and all that. Because there was one other person there kind of being snobbish, I won't say who. It's like, man, they ain't even playing the game right, man. He playing these rounds, and I'm like, eh, let it go. 
You because, know what? Because honestly, now that I think about it, because I was going to get to this point, kind of jumping ahead. Right. I understand, of course, you know, KOF has naturally just been, you know, the whole 3v3 thing and like the very unique team because there's not like another fighting game that really does the whole pick your characters in the order you want to play them or whatnot. Right. You know, Jin Doji Wong that was inspired by KOF adopted that. Yeah, you know I'm saying? Probably. But I do... Well, no. No, I had a tag mechanic. Yeah, a tag mechanic. Well, yeah, tag. Okay, yeah. Remember, KOF did not get a tag mechanic until much later on. Right, right, right. Like, they were doing just the whole pick your character, select the order, boom, and then... Just run the gauntlet. Yeah, that's what you do. Now... Now, like, uh, back to the whole three character thing. Hopefully in the next KOF... I hope there's a little bit more priority. Like, hope there's a little bit more priority put on like a division of people playing one v ones, right? And I mean like online and stuff like that, because I'm pretty sure the modes are there. It was there in 14. I'm pretty sure it's there in 15. I could be wrong, but like I said, I've always played just you know tradi- tradi- traditional KOF. <laughs> now here's the other thing. Here's the, and this is my type of mentality, right? Because like I said, I can. You can just pick your, your and, but, and before like just to wrap it up on wrap it up with a bow, y'all playing because see the thing is, them playing those one v ones in fourteen for so long, they then graduated to the three v three natural because right. they finally found three characters they were into. Right now, continue because this now, is another this, this is your story. Another uh, way y'all can take this approach because like I said, you do the one v ones like I mentioned earlier until you get comfortable with that character and just kind of go from there. Or, this is what I did sometimes as well. Uh, like I said, my main character uh, at the beginning of 14 was Benny Morrow. So, mm-hmm. sometimes I would just pick two other characters that I was mildly interested in and just save the character that I knew how to play as my anchor. Right. And then just kind of figure out and figure out even if I like these characters while I'm playing through the match. And then once they got knocked out, I bring in the anchor that I actually know how to play. See, and like that, you were now getting the idea of how to structure a team. You know what I'm saying? Because when people think of these team fighters, like I said, they people are more attracted to the Marvel and, like you mentioned, the cross tag style. Right. They like the stuff where it's like, you know, I can tag this character out if, you know, oh, everybody can kill them, but tag this character out, you know? And like I said, KOF didn't get that until later on. Which is funny because they did it for two games and then reverted back after that. But, like, I just like the fact that it, you know, I wasn't, like, I didn't take so much offense to, like, you know, like the one person was like, they ain't playing it, bro. You know, no, this is how they gonna learn the characters. This is how they gonna learn the characters, and that's how it happened. You know, my favorite KOF. And the reason why, is... and the reason why I say like I wish there was a little bit more priority on playing one v ones in KOF is because some people might not think it, and they're traditionalists. But I'm gonna need people who have been down with the series for a long time to step outside the bubble and think about it from the perspective of people like Smile, Smiles, and other people that want to get into it, step by step by step. You know, it's already going to be very intimidating with a person learning three characters. I think doing like a 1v1 or having something where 1v1s have a little more priority or, or more visibility, that will help them graduate to classic KOF. You know what I'm saying? Right. Now, speaking of which, uh, as a lot of you know, well, some of you might not know, but part of getting better at fighting games is getting your ass whooped. <laughs> Cause it's not always about winning and losing. And when KOF specifically, I have one vivid memory of uh, another friend of ours. Doesn't really play fighting games a lot, but when he does, he always makes it fun and exciting. Uh, I am, of course, talking about the Phantom Prophet, oh. Don Von Bliss. Oh, okay. If you remember, he used to play uh, Clark. Yes. He'll hit the super. I'm gonna take you over there. <laughs> Don't play over there. Now I'm gonna take you over there. And see, that's another thing. It's like these characters can elicit like different responses from you. Like these, because I can't stand like people. Like I don't know why people get off to this type of stuff. I already hate the tribalism with the wrestling community. Why y'all getting into the tribalism when it comes to like? 
KOF and this game and that one. Like, freaking SNK and Capcom are on good terms now. I know some people probably don't want it now thanks to, I think it was Hideaki Tsuno who is retiring from Capcom. Some people don't want CVS3 now because he's kind of like one of the brain, like the brain, like the child, like the guy right. when it came to that. And I understand that, but you no, know, because when you don't have key people like that, it might not hit the same. Right. That's why Takashi Nishiyama was so pivotal when he went from Capcom over to SNK and made Fatal Fury. Remember that guy made the first Street Fighter. Mm. You know, so and honestly, like that right there alone should shut this whole freaking Street Fighter, Capcom, SNK, Fatal Fury, KOF mess down. The guy that made Street Fighter made Fatal Fury. Right. And then on top of that, we now got Fatal Fury characters coming to Street Fighter Six. Exactly. And another bit of advice, people. Uh, when you're playing and you're trying to get better, do not th- throw throw winning out of your mind when you're trying to improve. Just make little milestone increments. This match, I'm going to try to take throws. This match, I'm going to... See how good I can react. The lows, this, that, and other. Like, stop trying to win every single match. And I know it's, you know, tempting to, you know, want to try to win because that's, you know, way, the nature of the game. You want to beat the person, prove you're better, or whatever. But to get to a sufficient skill level, you have to learn. And to learn, you're going to have to lose. So with you, that involved when you were trying to discover other characters... And I mean, that's going to happen. You got to get familiar, like, unless, like, and it very rarely happens, but, like, unless just right off the bat, whether you've played another character in another game that's very much like this character, and it's just like, boom, moment you freaking play the character, it's like it all comes to you. Like when I like when I came off the heels of MKX and got on the XR sign, because right. Ramlethal in that game was like combo heavy in the sense of like just single button pressures in combination instead of like chaining special moves together just like Mortal Kombat they were like Mortal Kombat and my guilty gear how dare you but like cause that's the thing I almost kind of feel like in addition to learning three characters the roster size can be a little bit intimidating too it is cause with me depending on which game we're right. cause in most now, cases KOF games like Rosters are relatively big. Right. Like, in one of the most highly favored KOFs, KOF 13, it's... Uh, mm. But, like, you know, 2002 UM, and you all know why that... Y'all know why that freaking roster's loaded. And then, even with freaking KOF 15, that's a pretty sizable roster. And I'll, uh, I'll say this, mm-hmm. because size of the roster is intimidating, right? And for me, uh, Lotus knows this about myself, in most fighting games... I am what you call a, a one-trick pony. Not to say that I do the same thing over and over again, but I pick one character, and that is my character. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it will be a very unusual sight to see me playing anybody else but that character. So, like, when it came to you venturing off to get, like, your first trio, like, how'd that go about? Because, uh, like I said... I told you in the last week's video, mm-hmm. love electric characters. So, uh, Benny Morrow, Sylvie, you all know. Automatically. Who was your third? Uh, in the case of 14, yes. uh, I really gravitated towards on hell. Mostly, because I, I like, because when it comes to fighting games specifically, I, like, I do Stop also saying, that's like... That's a big-ass freaking monster, too. <laughs> right. Uh, I do also like unorthodox characters to a degree. And the way on hell's combo structure worked was very unorthodox, but it was also really precise because mm-hmm. it, it it was more or less a series of chain combos, right? Instead of just linking X, Y, Z together, I it's like saying. you, 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 you do this. If you do this, you can do X, Y, Z. They if know. you do X, then they yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just making sure, you know, they you know. might get some first time viewers, you know. <laughs> Well, they had somebody first time like, what you talk about? Then they go look up the moves list in the mess. About a mile long. Right. It's like, hey, uh, do left punch. If you do left punch, do all this shit. 
If you do right. And also, I remember when you were doing that, because once you had mentioned on hell, I might get ready for a study session. Oh, I mean, but, but and, also, and, but I, also and I, I excelled at those classes. But also, guess who I told you, like, you know, you wanted to play to get a feel for old Nelson. Ooh, boy. Even though, like, he has his own little brand, but, like. I did like Nelson. Nelson was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't come back because, like, of all the people from that particular team, the South America team, that is, he was the one that had, like, a narrative, like, a story. The way people throw around narrative now, I kind of hate the word, but he had a story that seemed like it could go to the next step. And not to mention, with even though everything in there wasn't in lockstep with the manga and all that, SNK did pull bits and pieces. Uh-huh. And I wondered, were they going to do something with the fact that you got these mysterious doctors who gave him that prosthetic? Like, were they going to be exposed as nests and he's almost like an unknowing nest agent or something like that? But unfortunately, we didn't see him, Mandetas, or Zarina. Zarina did get some more screen time than her partners because she was in SK Heroines. And yes, I mentioned that game, and that is the farthest I'm going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> But like, would you? So would you also say that King of Fighters is hard? Yes and no. Hmm. Because I would say, at least from my personal experience, uh, it's it has a higher floor to get into. Mm. But once you once you in there, then you you in there basically, right? I, 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 I will say it's not easy to just pick it up. Mm-hmm. But once you get in there and you're familiar with things, then it's smooth sailing. Once right. you're familiar with how to play the game. Right. Because one thing that I hear people post to counter the usual reason that people have for not getting into KOF, mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, i got to learn three characters. They'll counter by the fact that Apparently, some of the same people that say that, they love Marvel. They love Dragon Ball Fighters. Now, I could say, especially when it comes to Dragon Ball Fighters, the entry level, or at least like far as like getting a grip on that game, even as some, like I said, I played KOF for like ever since 94. <laughs> The entry level is like, it's a little bit lower when it comes to Dragon Ball Fighters. Like, you can, it'll take you about maybe, you'll be comfortable with a nice couple of, like, you could probably learn three characters in a day in Dragon Ball Fighters. As far as, like, getting a good grip on the character. Yeah, because, like, of course, there's always going to be stuff. There's always. Wait, right, with Fighters, the characters are still unique, but. The way you play that game, like you, yeah. can, the characters are more in line, yeah, with how you play that game in general. They're not so widely diverse. And I'm not even just talking in the sense of like combo structure, because someone will tell you also with most of the crazy advanced combo. Well, eh, not the crazy advanced ones, like the stuff that Ash Crimson does. Right. Obviously, that's gonna take you some work. But I'm like the main. Like, the main combo recipe, then, like, the main structure of combos, like, in KOF, is just, like, people will tell you, in most cases, you might land, like, a jump-in move, like, a jump-in, or, like, a short hop move, and you can confirm, you hit with another normal, you'll do a command normal, and if you want to do more, you'll probably max mode right there, and then do something else. Right. Or, if you just want to keep it simple, it's almost kind of like how you would think combos are structured in Street Fighter, Albeit with not as many like links, if you will. Not saying there are no links in KOF. There are, as far as like 15 and everything, but it's different. With freaking Dragon Ball Fighters, it's like everybody, when it comes to the basics, when you're like learning a character's basics in most cases, they, as you mentioned, they're a lot more alike then. Right. You're going to be learning about when to use your Dragon Dash and all that. And of course, like, you know, even still, like, it's, and I'm, for the record here, we're talking about just getting a good grip on the character. Because even in Dragon Ball Fighters, every character got their little intricacies and they have, like, their little unique combo structures and setups and gimmicks and everything, where it's like you have to get used to that. Because it was kind of crazy. <laughs> it was kind of crazy, like, learning, like, 
not DBS, but the Canon. Like, ew, I just, he is Canon Broly. <laughs> DBS, Canon Broly, the same one. Not him, but the other one. The other one. Kakarot. That one right there. Oh, Lord. It's <laughs> I feel you on that. Oh my god, he's so goddamn cool. I feel you. I feel you. I feel you because the thing that's like one character where it's like the first original Broly is like had a great design, but it's like that storyline to me annoyed me. It's like this is the reason why you hate this feed. You hate him for doing what babies fucking do. <laughs> Somebody did a uh, a meme, like a little short on TikTok mm-hmm. where you there's an episode of Family Guy right. where Brian is just like sitting in a restaurant trying to eat and there's a baby crying next to him and then he's brian's supposed to be broly oh, the baby's wow. supposed to be goku and baby's sitting there crying brian's trying to eat his food and he's just where where you like that huh where where <laughs> i guess now you put it like that they might that might have made <laughs> might have made the original broly rel- relatable it was like Pretty much it would apply to both of them because like even with those two being like of the same character as far as like just offshoots of each other and everything, even their play styles, like when it, when I started learning like their advanced combos, it was always kind of funny. Because with the TODs with the original Broly, like it involved like using the projectile he had then because he had a projectile where he would fire it if you're far from him. But like if you were closer, it was almost like he was grabbing you. Yeah, because like with with DBS Broly, mm-hmm. it's like as far as like how they feel playing them. Uh, DBS Broly is like I can't control this. I'm losing control. And not to mention but, DBS Broly had like I think some of the worst buttons in the game. But with classic Broly, it's normals, like normals that is normals. Right. Uh, classic Broly, it's like I know I'm the shit and I am finna kill you. <laughs> Because the combo structure of, like, DBS, Broly's, like, more advanced combos, like the little loops in the corner where it's, like... Yeah, with the, the yeah, little drop ball. Like that right there was something else. But, like, that's, like, when you move further on. But, like, far as, like, just getting a decent grip, like, that game, you know... Because people will call it a baby game. I'm not going to call it that shit. Then. Right. Because it's, like, it's just, you know... Because you're not going to... Unless, like... <laughs> If you get auto combo to death, then there's just something wrong with you. That's how I put it. <laughs> One of my favorite voice lines is from Classic Broly when he does it. Look, here's a present for you. <laughs> yeah, I remember that because the Japanese dub of that to me was kind of funny because it kept reminding me of Hazuma. It kind of reminded me of Hazuma. <laughs> so. Getting back to what I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier that I was going to drag back a video idea that some of you might remember, and the funny thing about it is behind the scenes, it's actually coming into form. Who listening to this podcast remembers when you all wanted me to pitch an idea for a Cronin versus Nameless angle storyline whatever you want to call it in king of fighters 16 basically i was going to put together i guess a fanfic i suppose basically how i would introduce nameless that is in this case since he's not canon of course how would i introduce him into the kof lore now we're gonna have a little bit of story time here but i just want to put some stuff out there this is going to be a summary it's going to be the Cliff Notes version. I'm not going to go over too much of the dialogue or any of that because that is going to be for later. I really do hope this project gets to a point where I can have a full on, like, full quality video. Mr. Smiles here, to my surprise, <laughs> has been recruiting voice actors. <laughs> yes, I have. So I'm actually glad that this particular project is kind of being revived, but I did want to at least give a summary of how I would do things. Just as a little bit of a treat. I just thought about it in the back of my head one day. And I mean, on top of that is, it's the 30th anniversary of KOF. So why not do something a little special? Like I said, Cliff Notes version here. I don't want to keep you all here all day because I know you got stuff to do and everything, but best believe the way and all the stuff that's been happening in the background. I can't wait for this to actually take some form right here. So, nameless, right? 
Nameless would keep his design and his powers intact because I happen to like those. I will play into the fact that him and Cronin are so similar. That's going to definitely be a part of the storyline. But the one thing that I would change about his backstory is how he learns about his lover, Isolde. Instead of learning about her earlier on when he cornered a man attempting to abandon nests, I'd have it to where Nameless doesn't learn the truth about her at all in the beginning. That truth being that Nest tortured her with hellacious experiments, killing her in the process. Now, Nest would also take note of the strong romantic bond between the two of them when Isolde was alive. I'd keep it to where Nest infused her essence into his glove. However, they do not tell him that it is her essence. More on that later. As a result, Isolde becomes like a bargaining chip because with this particular setup, in my story at least, the way I would do it, is Isolde would become like this apparition that appears faintly in his dreams and he'll hear her voice in his conscience, but he doesn't exactly know what this voice is trying to tell him. He recognizes her and knows that this is the girl that he fell in love with, but she's trying to send him a message and it's not getting through. This storyline is going to go on to involve Ness going to extreme lengths to, in order to keep Nameless under their control and prevent them having yet another person defect from the cartel. This whole, you're going to see it as we go along, basically what's going to happen is they are going to go at extreme lengths to make sure that this man does not summon her spirit to tell him the truth about what really happened to her. So... In my story, Nest is going to be led by the recently revived Ignis, who of course was one of the souls trapped inside a verse. Now remember, you remember the Team Cronin storyline where there was a drone spying on them and then Cronin destroyed it? In my story, despite Cronin torching, or excuse me, that's not funny, despite Cronin torching that particular drone, Nest was actually able to record and get a visual of all three members of Team Cronin. Cronin, of course, Angel, and Kula. Nameless returns to Ignis after completing another assassination mission. So as he walks in, Ignis is going to show the footage to him. And once Nameless gets a glance at Kula, he mistakenly sees her as the girl that he sees in his dreams, because if y'all have seen what Isolde looks like in certain concept art, she does very much resemble Kula. And they're going to pretty much bank on that to pull this whole stunt. Ignis, who was filled in on the information about Nameless, Asolda, and their bond, their relationship, however you want to put it, he took note of this and begins to manipulate him. He tells Nameless that the blue-haired girl seen with Angel and Cronin, he tells him that that is Asolda. And then he tells them that those two other people have kidnapped her, and they plan to kill her. And if Nameless could capture Cronin and Angel and bring them back to Ignis, he will ensure that his love will be safe. And of course, Nameless agrees with no hesitation whatsoever. Now, in the case of Team Cronin, I would keep their KOF 15 ending intact. If you recall, Kula goes with Diana and Foxy, and Cronin and Angel, they go about their way, continuing to dodge the cartel. While this is going on, Ignis continues training Nameless and even starts implanting this anti-Cronin sentiment into his mind. And now it's not just, I got to save her from them, but he sees Cronin as an inferior imitation of him. Like it is hatred now. So while this hatred made Nameless all the more powerful and dangerous, much to the pleasure of Ignis and Ness, they didn't realize that this brought about a problem. The reason why Ness implanted his soul's essence into Nameless's glove was to utilize her cryokinetic powers to protect and cool him down should his flames get out of control. But as I mentioned, this is part of the big lie that they're using to keep Nameless under control. Just making sure y'all get that. They're keeping the big lie so he cannot remove the glove and he cannot lose control. Thus, of course, Ignis and the rest of the cartel is monitoring him strictly. Cameras all over the freaking place. <laughs> so, time passes by. They're training and training and training and training. And then the next KOF tournament in KOF 16 would roll around. Ignis is overwhelmingly satisfied with Nameless and was confident that he would successfully carry out their mission to capture Cronin on Hell and other traitors. Ignis is so confident that he was actually thinking of sending in Nameless as a solo entry. 
a Nest advisor warned against this because, of course, there's a possibility that he could take the glove off. And if they take the glove off, the jig is up. So, reluctantly, because, of course, Ignis doesn't want to die again, he forms a trio consisting of him, Nameless, and the other recently revived character, Chrysalid. So then they go to tell Nameless about their new trio, since he's still under the impression that he's going in solo. And as Ignis goes to Nameless, he's playing with the glove, almost like he wants to take it off. Ignis, of course, stops him, and Nameless then starts to ask, and it's like, how did I get the glove, exactly? Ignis lies to him and says, of course, he kind of tells like a half-truth, if anything, because he does say that is his soul's essence, but... He then tells them that that is the reason why she was kidnapped by Conan and not Hell, to take that power and keep it for themselves. He also asks them, like, why do you all keep telling me I gotta keep the glove on? And Ignis says, while you have gotten stronger, you do not have true power over your flames. And we cannot have you go and lose the control because if you lose control, you won't be able to save your love. And you'll thwart our mission, basically. So, of course, Nameless heeds all that and rests up preparing for the tournament. Except, <laughs> it's actually a freaking sleepless night. Remember how I told you how Isolde faintly appears in his conscience and speaks to him through dreams and his conscience and everything? Well, that causes him to have sleepless nights because the girl that he keeps seeing in his visions, Isolde, says the same thing to him, and he's not exactly sure what this means. The thing she tells him is, let go, let go, let go, my love. This, of course, like I said, has been troubling him to where it's a bunch of sleepless nights, but... So then the next day, the Nest Cartel gets some really good news. They got a tip from one of their spies who happened to find out where Angel and Cronin were. They were several miles from a gas station out in the desert where they had stopped to refuel their motorcycle. The cartel quickly sets out to confront them, and the Ness trio intercepts the motorcycle with a massive blast. The trio confronts Cronin and Angel, with Ignis demanding that they surrender to him and no harm will come upon them. They refuse, and then Cronin proceeds to try to take a swipe at Ignis, only to be cut off by, you guessed it, Nameless. And Nameless proceeds to beat the brakes off of Cronin. Like, (laughs) Cronin doesn't get any offense in. The more Nameless beat him, the more Angel cries as Chrysalid and Ignis have her basically restrained and they are forcing her to watch this. They are torturing her. In between the offense, Nameless keeps asking Cronin, where is Isolde? Where is Isolde? Now, of course, Cronin does not know who that is. (laughs) So, of course, he keeps saying, I don't know, I don't know. And he gets annoyed to the point where he starts even insulting the guy. And after a couple of insults, Nameless's temper is off the scales. And then Ignis sees it, knowing that the power, if he just lets the limitation go, that being his glove, he knows that he could freaking disintegrate this guy. He makes way, he starts to steal towards the glove. And just before he tries to take it off, Ignis stops him. Because Angel has given them the information they were looking for. Angel basically tells them that the little girl, the blue-haired girl, they sent her back with Diana and Foxy. Now, of course, of course, Cronin, not Cronin, but freaking Chrysalid and Ignis have been dead during this time. A lot of this information, if you're wondering, the cartel is filling them in on it. Because the information that was brought to Ignis, he then proliferates to Nameless. He's like... We heard about them. Those two are also traitors, and apparently they're somewhere about the city. And with this information, Nameless feels a bit hopeful. It's like, finally, he's getting closer to finding Isolde. So Nameless wants to go and see what the spies found far as, like, the people that he... (laughs) Far as the people who has who he thinks is Isolde, but isn't. As he sets off to try to go towards the city, Ignis stops him and says, hold on. We still have to detain the traitors, though. But Nameless is like, I brought them here to you. Like, why not? Like, I did what I did. It's time to hold up your end of the deal. And as 
surprisingly, a little bit of bickering back and forth between Ignis and Nameless happens. Like, Nameless, knowing that he has the information or could get the information he wanted to find in Solda, actually is set on his own mission. And as he's about to go into town, Ignis shoots one of his tendrils at him and grabs him by the arm and says, you're supposed to obey me. Nameless retaliates by chopping off that tendril and things get all the more crazy between the two of them. Long story short, the both of them bicker long enough to where Angel creeps away and actually is able to drag Cronin back to their motorcycle, which they found. The motorcycle's busted up, but it actually can still go, and they manage to escape. What they don't realize here, at least what Nameless didn't realize, was Ignis allows this to happen, so once again, hey, he didn't deliver the traitors to him, so then, without them, I'm not going to tell you what the spy said. Pretty much still holding it over his head. So then, Nameless proceeds back, and he goes back with his trio back to the nest hideout. <laughs> so now, of course, the story shifts to Cronin being carried by On Hell over her shoulder, and I mean, he's damaged. Like I said, <laughs> Nameless beat the shit out of him. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing at that. That's bad. I'm sorry. But anyways, like I said, they found their motorcycle. It's kind of damaged, but it can still go. And Angel goes around looking to see if they could possibly find anyone to, of course, heal Cronin. Now, seeing that they're on the run, and of course the Nest Cartel is still on them, they know they can't really go into any areas, like for instance, a public health facility, because if they go there, the cartel is going to be right there on their back. They drive around, drive around, and then they just happen upon this random shack in the middle of nowhere. Angel... Seeing that, psh, what you have to lose, aside from possibly be, <laughs> being yelled at by some stranger figures, why not? She goes up to the shack and knocks on this door, like, panically. She's knocking, like, please, please, please answer. I have a friend of mine that is wounded, and we need help. A woman opens the door. Initially, she is hesitant to let these two in or even help them because they're strangers, of course. This mystery woman's whole attitude changes from being stubborn and not wanting them around to then concerned when Angel mentions Ness. After she mentions Ness, she lets Angel and Cronin in and actually sets Cronin like on a couch in the room to where she starts tending to his wounds. After doing a bit of work, she turns to Angel and says, he should be okay in the morning. Then this woman and Angel have a conversation. Angel was curious as to why her whole demeanor changed when she mentioned the Nest Cartel. The woman stares back at Angel and says, I used to work for Ness as a medic. And Angel's like, you used to? And then the woman, not to get too much to the dialogue, she goes on to tell her that the Ness Cartel had fired her after she had refused to give them her heart. And when she refused to give them her heart, not only did she get fired from the cartel, but they also started a smear campaign that got out there into the public. And this smear campaign simply just painted this woman as being crazy and insane and nobody should listen to her. Anything she says about anything is a lie. That's why this woman lives out in the middle of nowhere in a shack by herself. Now, Angel was confused when she mentioned they took your heart. It's like you still got a beating heart, clearly, and you're alive, right? But this mystery medic woman just brushes off that and says, Ah, forget that. You told me you're trying to go after Ness, right? And Angel says, Yeah. And she's like, Well, bring me along with you because I want a piece of him too. And just out of nowhere, Angel's weirded out by this woman, but knowing that they don't have any other partners since they returned Kula back, she figured, why not? Now, you're probably wondering who this woman is. Well, after that conversation, the woman tells Angel to go get some rest, and she'll see them in the morning. And before they go to bed, Angel is like, wait a minute, I didn't get your name. And the woman introduces herself as Dr. Ada Delgado. Yep, this is about to be controversial, but that's exactly what happened with this story. It's kind of an intermission right here. But yes, Dr. Ada Delgado is an all-original character, pretty much created by myself and 
Mr. Smiles right here. That's me. And I know that y'all have missed hearing him and <laughs> tired of hearing my voice tell this story. So I'm going to have Mr. Smiles explain Dr. Ada Delgado to you all. Let me get my reading glasses on. Me and Mr. Lotus here have been conspiring to create this new character for this uh, for this little story. This fan fiction, if you will, mm-hmm. that Lotus is uh, cooked up for you people. Uh, and we went back and forth about potential designs and the way the character would function and how they would talk and things of that nature. Yeah. And to give you a bit of a rough visual, uh, imagine older woman. She's uh, brown skinned. Is well dressed for the most part. Has you know dress pants, has the uh, dress shirt on without the blazer, uh, and the sleeves are rolled up. And she has a series of, uh, for lack of a better term, vials, potions, uh, medicines around her belt. And she's adorned with a hat that has a plague doctor esque mask. To go along with it. Yeah, with that right there, I also want to just interject for a little bit and give a special thanks to Onyx Blade for this because Onyx was the one that ran the idea by me about making original characters because when I was wondering who else would team up with Cronin and On Hell, I really couldn't get anybody that I thought would be decent. And so Onyx, when I was talking to him about it, he said, you might have to make some original characters. And it's like, I know how controversial that might be, but hey, it was still fun. It was still fun putting this character together. So, yeah. So, Mr. Smiles, you mentioned the drip and everything. What is Ada like? What's her personality like? Uh, From the outside looking in, from a passersby or a stranger that meets her, she will come across as very strange. Uh... Almost a, uh, not quite Faust from a Guilty Gear, but just very, uh, a very odd person to be around. Somewhat eccentric. Yes, yeah. very, very eccentric. Uh, seemingly very happy. Uh, almost to a unsettling degree. At least, well, yeah, like, almost, almost kind of like that person that's just like, you know, I guess they seem happy despite the fact it's like they're in pain or something. Uh, so, something so Because similar. remember, like... Ness took her heart from her. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, the way I would compare, what I would use to compare that unsettling happiness, uh, Lotus here, uh, back in his heyday, he used to play Smite. Uh, you remember the plague doctor Izanami skin? Of course. I'm thinking of that. Don't worry, I'm a surgeon with this thing. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's that particular character there. That is kind of what Ada's going to be like in terms of battle, because Ada has this whole thing where it's like, she's kind of weird, but seems like a, this is going to sound funny, but a very normal, weird person. But then in battle, because whenever she goes into battle, she has, because she loves to be stylish regardless, like no matter how crazy you think she is, she goes into battle, of course, with the top hat and the mask. For some reason, whenever she puts the mask on, she goes cuckoo. She goes cuckoo. And not for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> Speaking of in battle, what can you tell us about her fighting style? So when me and Lotus were going back and forth about how we wanted her to play, uh, even though she was a doctor and we had this idea about potions and things of that nature in her kit, we also liked the idea of her being brawlic and very like up close and personal. So... For those of you that remember our uh, Omen of Sorrow video series, <laughs> if you can... That's not many of them. Right. But the only person watching that probably remembers it is probably Onyx. Right. But just to be fair, you know, if, if, if you take a look back at uh, Lotus's earlier catalogs, we did a video on a character named... Ooh. He was based off of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I think uh, it was just called Hyde. Dr. Hyde. Yeah, Dr. Hyde. Uh, and he was... He used a lot of potions, like rolling them on the ground, chucking them in the air, and he, different potions had different effects on the on the opponent and things of that nature. And me and Lotus kind of hybridized that with Yamazaki to a degree. 
where it's like this very crazy, uh, excited type of character. Yeah, because I would always just describe her fighting style as just, it's very underhanded and she's kind of cheating because I imagine stuff like, for instance, she'll come in their arm with like a club of sorts. And then, of course, as you mentioned with the potions, you know, she could throw them. But also I had this idea of like a move where she has a command grab where she actually injects you with stuff like because she's going to have this coat and it's full of like a whole bunch of different tools. And I actually thought about that particular aspect when I saw an unreleased Sam show character who basically has like that little cloak on. I think she's like a nun, I think, or like a monk and she's in a cloak. But then, like, under the cloak, there were all these different tools or something like that. Like, that's where I got that idea from. But also, she does stuff like, for instance, like, you know, of course, like, with Yamazaki, he mentioned that. Like, I had an idea for, like, just basically picking up, like, sand and just throwing it in people's faces and maybe it stuns them and whatnot. And then it's, like, pretty much throughout the whole entirety of, like, the match, like, most of her moves, she's cackling and being bloodlusty and everything. You know, like, she's, a, like, Dr. Eight is crazy. She's crazy. You know, it would be a interesting visual aesthetic since you mentioned the whole kicking, picking up sand and throwing it in the face. Well, whatever. Uh, like, we discussed the potion gimmick where right. she might inject you with something and have different effects. Right. Uh, to go along with the sand gimmick, uh, what if she had a vial of something, crushed it in her hands, and just flung the liquid at you? In that same vein of like picking up sand and throwing it in your face to blind you. Yeah, it could be, but like, I like that. But like, I just conceptualize it as like she is so cuckoo and she doesn't really have any formal training in martial arts, but then it's like she will literally try to grab anything nearby and try to use it as a weapon or whatnot. Yeah. But also, it's like when I talk about cheating, I mean like a whole lot of underhanded stuff. Like, I'm thinking like maybe her forward throw could be like poking someone in the eye or something. Which is my inner wrestling fan coming out because it's the thumb to the eye. Right. The whole thumb to Throw the eye. Throw a banana peel on the grind. Things of that nature. But, like, this is just rough ideas or whatnot. But Dr. Eight is crazy because Ness took something very precious from her. They took her heart. Getting back to the story, now if you will. Back at the Ness hideout, Ignis was pretty pissed off about that little scene that name was caused by defying him. And even Krizlet agrees with him, thinking that neither one of them can really trust him after pulling something like that. Despite the fact that they didn't want to do it because even Ignis himself says, if he has to team with Nameless and he pulls something like that, he is going to kill him. Which even, <laughs> it's almost like this weird place between, I have this mission, but like, and we need this guy to do it, but like, I am going to kill him if he doesn't straighten up. And then Chrysalid remembers that one of the Nest staff actually mentioned something about two defective Nest projects that were still in reserve. And seeing that, of course, Ignis does not want to team with Nameless after what had happened, and seeing that, of course, these could be two other people that could keep an eye on Nameless to make sure he does not trigger or summon Isolde, he actually agrees. So he's like, bring me these two other subjects, these test subjects or whatever. And so the way I visualize it is there is this underground cell in the hideout of Ness. And down here is where experiments that are looked at as defects are held. Chrysalid walks Ignis to this area where there are three cells. There is a cell in the middle and two on the side. The one in the middle, according to what the staff told them, used to be occupied by Nameless. The two people that they're looking to get, or the two experiments, if you will, are in the neighboring cells and they've been there for quite some time. Chrysalid opens the door and both of them come out and we are introduced to... Two more original characters that we created for this. And that would be Axel and Gil. And in swoops, Mr. Smiles for this one then. Now, to give you an idea of how this all came along, with these characters, I had concepts and I had ideas, and I would pitch them to Mr. Smiles here, and he would add some stuff, sometimes like propose, maybe add this to this character or add this aspect. I would approve some stuff and some stuff I'm like, nah, that's how it happens, so... In the case of Axel and Gil, because I think when it came to Ada, that one was just point A to point B. 
Right. Like I just liked it from top to bottom. Right. This one we came to something. It was just that I remember like I wanted some changes here. There was some back and forth. Some back back and forth. A little back and forth. So explain like however you want to in whatever order. Like how did you conceptualize Axel and Gil? So we'll talk about Axel first. Okay. So with Axel, uh, if you can imagine, you know, your typical know-it-all character in anime or video games, that's actually, but in this case, he's actually a know-it-all. Yeah, he's uh, the genius that also is full of his geniusness. Right. Um, and his uh, power, for uh, for lack of a better term, his what he gained from being experimented on by Ness, um, he can effectively remove parts of his body at will. Mm-hmm. And he can transform them into various weapons, drills, uh, just a bunch of random things that he can use at his disposal. Yep. And um, these parts can also explode as well if he commands it. Right. And his defect, as uh, Lotus stated earlier, uh, he has a gem in his forehead. And if well, that is. Well, just to jump ahead there, like, that is. That is correct what he said there, but the reason why Nest labeled them as defective, the prime reason is the fact that we'll find you'll find out with their personality. But like when we say that this kid is a know-it-all, he actually, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to get too much into dialogue here, but he literally insults Ignis by saying that this cartel would have been a lot more effective, and perhaps Ignis and everybody else that died wouldn't have died if he had been in charge. Exactly. As a matter of fact, personality-wise, for the Guilty Gear fans out there, out there imagine Batman. Mm. Imagine, imagine Havoc with the mind of Batman. Yeah, and on top of that, like the powers that he mentioned, like I said, he's able like to detach parts of his body and make them into weapons, and like he could even make them explode if he wants to. Then this power was also seen, at least from Ness, as like, I mean, it's diabolical, but it seems like we can't control it. And not only can we not control that, but it seems like we can't control him because he thinks he knows everything. Right. Now, the thing that he mentioned with the gym on his head, that is still very important. Like, it's not a defect, but it is a very, very critical weakness. Explain, Mr. Smiles. If that gym is forcibly removed in any type of way, he is a goner. Yep. For lack of a better term. Like, pretty much if that gym is removed from him, it's almost like just ripping the battery out of something. It's just... Right. And the second cell, we have Gil. And Gil, when we were bouncing back and forth ideas, uh, we like the idea of a poison character. Yeah, because um, I know Mr. Smiles are asking me, like, are there any poison characters in KOF? And the closest thing that came to my mind was, I know Yamazaki had, like, a gimmick with the one super where it's, like, it'll do tick damage over time or whatnot. But as far as, like, we wanted, like, a full-on poison character, like a full-on, like, where that's just their essence. Not just one move, not just two, but we wanted this to be their essence. You know what I'm saying? So... That's how we came up with, you know, Gil. Continue right. on. Uh, so, with Gil, uh, she's a poison character, as Lotus previously stated. Um, and her design is more or less, uh, obviously, kind of gives off a toxic vibe. Um, she's able to create, like, these deadly poisons that are effectively 100% lethal. But her defect is is that she is unable to breathe clean air. She has to breathe caustic, toxic air. And her the other uh, defect, Axel, he created a breathing apparatus for her to yep. funnel and filter toxic air into her lungs so that she can actually breathe. Yep, they did. They, they literally pulled this while they had been in prison there for that much time. And I, I was gonna I was gonna save this for the end, but I guess you put it there then or whatnot. These two are siblings. Yes. They're siblings. And just like you stated earlier, Lotus, with uh Axel being a know it all and very difficult to work with, mm-hmm. Gil is also 
very difficult to work with for one reason and one reason only. Even though she, on paper, has very deadly capabilities, she is incredibly, and I mean incredibly, astronomically lazy. So much so that Machen Kuhn is like, what the world is this? <laughs> yeah, so it would be these two characters that step out. Now, we've given you a good... Now, that explanation was really good because I can kind of zap through this now. But of course, with them being summoned, not summoned like in the way with the soul, I probably shouldn't have used that, but when they come from their cells, they are introduced, of course, to Chrysalid and Ignis, and Ignis sets down the plan on what they want them to do, and that is to follow Nameless and make sure he does not remove the glove on his hand. They are going to be his partners in the King of Fighters tournament. Now, given their personalities that we mentioned before, not to mention seeing that that was a part of the reason why they were seen as defects, they're like, fuck that. <laughs> like I said, Axel literally insulted them. Like, here's one piece of like dialogue where it's like the Nest Cartel would have been better and stronger and more efficient had he been running it. And Gil is pretty much just wayward and is like, I don't want anything to do with this. So, of course, with this disrespect, Ignis then threatens them and this goes back to one thing that was mentioned earlier, of course, with their drawbacks. Ignis actually gr grabs both of them. He grabs Axel by the gem that is implanted in him. And then he gets a hand on Gil's, the respirator that she has. Because, of course, he knows exactly about these defects. And he threatens them. It's like, either you do the tournament or I'm going to kill both of you right here on the spot. That was enough to scare them to despite them being brats, and they accept it. So now, Nameless, Axel, and Gil, we got the new Nest team. That's what we're going to call them, the new Nest team, or at least like for the time being. The NNT. Yeah. So now, fast forward, we're going to the KOF tournament, and the new Nest team pretty much just decimates several jobber teams. Like, they are just on it. The face-off that they're going to have where things get interesting is when they face off against the team of Kula, Diana, and Foxy. Yes, I would like for that to be a team in KOF 16. Please, SNK. Now, like I said, for all this time, they have been telling Nameless that this is a Solda. And the funny thing about it is, one of the twins, the siblings if you will, they actually opted to fight against Kula, but Nameless said step back. He goes up and actually tries to reason with Kula, talking about, you're my beloved, you're my Isolde. And Kula, as you could imagine, is weirded out. <laughs> this is like a tiny freaking little teeny bopper girl who thinks that this freak, like, imagine like, honestly, all you know in your life is kill, kill, and ice cream, and somebody is thinking that you're their lover or something. Like, just imagine how awkward and just weird that is. Initially, as Kula attacks him, Nameless doesn't fight back because he thinks this is his lover. He's finally got her and wondering, like, what's going on? After Kula throws a second flurry of attacks, Nameless then becomes more heartbroken, and he actually starts to fight back. He then accuses her partners, Diana and Foxy, of brainwashing her into forgetting who he is. That's not the case, though, because Kula doesn't know who he is. Kula further berates Nameless and even taunts him, and this sends him over the edge. Because think about it, he is thinking, what is going on here? This right here, this, this girl is like, this is the love of my life, right? The one I've seen in my dreams that's been talking to me, and instead she's attacking him and disrespecting him, and then the propaganda that Ness has just infused into him is just so crazy, he thinks that the partners of her manipulated her against them. Sends him over the edge, and it happens. He rips the glove off, and his flames go out of control. Of course, we're thinking about something along the lines of what's called the Rinku in 2002 UM. And of course, with that happening, Isolda appears before him. Her apparition appears before him. Isolda then shows him a flashback of when she and Nameless first met and then this proceeds to play all the way up to when Isolde is forcibly taken away to a test that ends up killing her. Isolde just revealed the truth to Nameless. 
Isolde then uses her icy essence to protect Nameless from being engulfed by his own flames and quell his powers. Back in the match, Nameless apologized to Kula before passing out right in front of her. Kula actually runs up to him and cries out for someone to help him, which confuses Diana and Foxy, but seeing that she's insistent about helping him, they actually help. Axel and Gil, who are of course Nameless's teammates, also join in to help carry away Nameless so we can recover. And knowing that the truth had been revealed and that more than likely they were going to be betrayed, Ignis and Chrysalid interfere in Team Kula's next match. Their interference actually causes the Kula team, the k team, and the Cronin team to join forces to take them down. Now initially the team struggles because they just got finished fighting their own matches and they're kind of fatigued. Fast forward, after a while, Nest and his teammates do return after Nameless himself had actually recovered a little bit from the events of his first match. Fast forward through all the action, the Nameless team or the new Nest team does make the save. It's a tough and long battle, but eventually Nameless, Axel, and Gil do at least defeat Ignis. They don't kill him, he actually manages to escape, and I did that because it's like, I didn't want to just bring him back just to get killed again. Like, you can keep him around for a little bit. Maybe, I guess, in the next KOF, or like, if there's, like, another extension. If, like, if I were in charge, like, if I didn't have any other plans for him, maybe then kill him off. But seeing that now another rivalry has spawned from that, like, Ignis has more enemies thanks to him lying and manipulating Nameless and, of course, prolonging the torture to the twins. Yeah. You could still do something with that. After this battle, of course, like I said, it's a long and grueling battle, but there's exhaustion, there's battle damage, <laughs> all the typical stuff that you would think that despite, of course, chasing Ignis away, Nameless and the twins definitely are worn down. So once again, you have everybody render aid to them. Kula skates up to Nameless because of course she has like the little skates or whatever. Once again, crying for somebody to help him out, but then noticed that the glove of his started to emit a great amount of what looked like fog. Moments later, Kula looked up and saw the spirit of Isolde, which probably was kind of weird because Kula probably felt like she was looking in a mirror. <laughs> and Isolde unleashed this icy energy unto Nameless, comforting him. Nameless opened his eyes, which met with those of Isolde's spirit, which she says, I will always be by your side. Nameless smile, they smile at each other, and then her spirit returns back to his glove. Nameless then goes around and apologizes to everyone from Kula to Cronin for all the trouble that he caused. Kula accepted his apology with a smile, and as a little joke, ha ha ha, she even offered him ice cream. In typical Kula fashion. While he liked the offer, Nameless refused, and in the terms of Cronin, Cronin didn't say anything. He still harbored resentment towards Nameless for that assault from earlier when they first met. Although most of everyone else basically accepted his apologies and understood that he had been lied to and manipulated, Nameless still felt a world of guilt for the pain that he had caused. He felt it would be better if he just left all this behind and never came back to ensure that he could cause no more harm to anyone else. Kula begged him not to go, and seeing the sadness in his eyes and not wanting him to be alone. As Nameless began to take his leave, he then turns and looks back to where the twins are, because Asolda, if you recall, only healed him. Who do you think was possibly healing the twins? It was Dr. Ada. As Nameless and everyone is looking over at Dr. Ada tending to the wounds of Axel and Gil, we get to a point where Dr. Ada freezes. Like, she looks like she's horrified. Angel walks up to her and asks, is everything okay? And Dr. Ada snaps out of it and continues to render aid to the twins. And of course, once they're all fixed up, they decide to leave with Nameless as they look at Nameless as like a big brother figure. And they pretty much walk out into the sunset or whatnot. They will be back, of course, it's just that Nameless feels like, again, he's caused so much damage and he couldn't forgive the fact that he let himself be deceived, but he does vow to come back because, of course, 
Ignis. He wants to settle that score for good. Not to mention, of course, now that he knows the truth that Nest were the ones that killed Isolde, even more of a purpose to want to come back and help them take him down. And that pretty much is the long and short of that. You know, you can see the scene where it's like Kula and everyone waves to them. And he, everybody that looks at them favorably is like hoping that they come back someday to help them get rid of Ness for good. Now, I'm not saying that I am the best at making fan fiction. Quite frankly, I'm going to tell you all right now, this is the first time that I've ever written a fanfic ever. But the way that I visualize it is this. It's like if we're going to bring Nameless into the canon and seeing that we established that he has a rivalry with Ignis... And of course, with Ness as a whole, of course, we got to keep it going. We got to keep it going. That's just how I see it. And with that right there, hopefully some more of the Ness characters can now be brought into the forefront and actually have a storyline worthwhile. Because for the past while or so, minus, of course, the big comeback of Cronin, they really have just been sitting there just kind of doing nothing. Now, let me tell you all one more thing. So you're probably wondering, why was Dr. Ada so horrified when she was rendering aid to the twins? Now, we're not going to reveal this. I don't, well, as a matter of fact, I don't know how to reveal this as far as like in the story. But I will tell you all this. So remember what Dr. Ada said. Dr. Ada said that she was willing to team up with Angel and Cronin to get revenge on Ness for doing what? Taking her heart. When she examined the twins, she saw something very familiar. I'm pretty sure some of you might have predicted and see it already, but Axel and Gil are Ada's long lost children. When she said that Nest had stole her heart, she meant the kids, the two loves of her life. When she was examining them, you're gonna learn that just before Nest decided to take her children from her because Ness wanted more experiments and the cartel just so happened to find out that Ada had two kids. Once this bit of information had been leaked, they demanded that she submit them for experimentation. She said no, and they were taken away. Just before Ness took away her children and knowing that she couldn't do anything about it, she basically, I guess, left markings on them then, a tattoo, if you will, or tattoos being plural since there's two of them. Each of the twins have half of a heart tattooed on their body, and thus why Ada said that Ness stole her heart. And that is the long and short of it. You all are more than welcome to let me know what y'all think of it below. <laughs> like I said, this is my first ever time writing fan fiction of any kind. If y'all thought it was great, that's awesome. If y'all thought it was garbage, that's awesome too. <laughs> I mean, that was my first attempt. And like I said, that was just kind of a summary. Like I said, I have a whole story written up, narrative, dialogue, all that stuff. But I just wanted to skip over like the voice lines and just trim the fat so y'all wouldn't be here all day to give you an idea of that. And hey, you are more than welcome to recommend any changes that you would like to the storyline by chance. If you have any, maybe you like some parts of it and you did it. But did I have fun putting this together? Matter of fact, let me say that. Let me rephrase that. Did we have fun putting this together? Yes, we did. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Whew. That was fun, at least. That was a nice little change of pace to get away from the, the garbage from earlier. <laughs> exactly. Anything you want to add, anything you want to press, anything you want to promote, Mr. Smiles? Uh, not necessarily. Although, uh, I channel? think, well, that too. But I think Lotus stated earlier, uh, somewhere down the pipeline, there will be a long form version of this story that's uh, voice acted and whatnot. And uh, not going to put a date or a time frame on it, but it's coming. Uh, and that aside, uh, I think I plugged this on last week's episode as well. Plug it but, again. You know, new I have viewers. a new viewers. I, I have a YouTube channel coming up. Uh, it is 
simply titled Cheshire Cat. That's cat with a K because, you know, originality, I guess. Uh, and it will be more or less a channel discussing the aesthetics of different anime, video games, the inspirations that went into the designs of the character, and just all about art in general. So anytime after this upcoming Saturday, feel free to check the channel out because I will be posting my first video on Saturday. That's all you got there? That's all I got. Alrighty then. Why do I keep saying the freaking Jim Carrey line? Why? Oh, <laughs> oh my god, but that does it for this edition of the Chrysler Chronicles. Man, storytelling is freaking taxing on me because I feel like I'm <laughs> Yeah, that's probably also due to the fact I'm still recovering from this condition, but it's alright. But <laughs> of course I appreciate everybody that stops by to watch this here. As always, y'all take care of yourselves. Be safe out there. Be cool to each other. And please, please, please stay cool by staying hydrated in the heat. Y'all take care of yourselves. See ya. Hey, everybody. This is Chris Lotus from the future. And by the recording quality, you probably, <laughs> probably can guess. Because I know, like, you know, I've been doing this editing thing for a while. I know y'all can tell, like, the different quality of the audio compared to when I record from my house and when I record from Smile's house. But so one of our friends that dropped by and actually recommended something that I actually like as an idea. And I know I didn't really clarify on it too much. But um, Ada, Dr. Ada Delgado, I did mention that she was going to have like a club with her or something. But our friend here had recommended that it be a baseball bat with the word anesthesia like printed on it which i guess could open the way to like because <laughs> i mean honestly her being cuckoo and saying let me give you some anesthesia and swinging it in you with that because that's what i want that character to be like if i wanted to be because one thing i didn't mention because i want smiles do more to talking on it then because i know y'all are tired of hearing my voice the entire time <laughs> but I wanted Ada Delgado to be like a character that's like a different level of cuckoo. Like, I, cause of course, I mean, you know, the likes of Yamazaki or cuckoo and everything and all that, but I wanted Ada Delgado to be like insane, like a different level of insane, like cartoonishly, just cartoonishly batshit levels of insane. Right. And so, yeah, I like that idea. That might be something to consider, but. I just wanted to plug that right there for a bit because that was too good to not put here or whatnot, but that's all I wanted to do. And I'm going for real season's time. Same stuff applies in. Y'all take care. Mm -hmm.